All right, I think we're ready to go. So thanks so much everyone for joining us for today's webinar, Quantum Computing and Cryptography, a brief introduction. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. So today's webinar is being recorded and we're gonna be able to share a link with you after the event is complete with uh, slides and a recording link. And we welcome you to revisit the content yourself or share it with friends or colleagues or across social media, uh, any place that you'd like. Um, we also invite your comments and questions. So please look for the Q&A chat box on your screen. If you think of a question for the speaker at any point, just type it in and, um, and we will pose it at the end of the webinar in the Q&A session. Uh, today's presenter is Atul Lux. He is the head of cryptography at Hedera. And uh, at this time, I'm gonna hand the floor over to Atul who is going to start today's presentation. So Atul, it is all yours. Okay, thank you very much, Brady. So quantum computing has been hitting a lot of headlines recently. From using, being used to study wormholes to changing how computers fundamentally think, a lot of people are asking or wondering whether quantum computers will revolutionize the world. And a lot of this excitement is, is justified because quantum computers will have real economic impact. Quantum computers are good at two things. One thing is uh, simulating physical systems and chemical reactions that can be used to improve the design of solar cells, uh, design of drugs, superconductors, fertilizer. Another thing that quantum computers are really good at is also um, speeding up optimization and machine learning. That's why people are speculating that it'll actually kind of improve our AI. But quantum computers, they're not the end all be all of computing. Although they'll be able to help improve a wide range of products, they likely won't have a large impact on your day-to-day -day tasks, such as watching Netflix or checking your email. Um, quantum computers are, they're expected to be really good at a few specific tasks, but probably won't change general computing. If you, if you want more information about that, there's this great uh, accessible article written by a well-known uh, computer scientist, Scott Aronson, The Limits of Quantum Computers. In it, he says that, Quantum computers would provide dramatic speed-ups for a few specific problems. For other problems, however, such as playing chess, scheduling airline flights, and proving theorems, evidence now strongly suggests that quantum computers would suffer from many of the same algorithmic limitations as today's classical computers. Okay, so we're not expecting them to have much impact on your day-to-day -day tasks. However, there is one exception, cryptography. For those of you who aren't familiar with cryptography, it's literally used anytime you're interacting with your phone or with the internet or with a computer. I've given a few examples over here on the slide. At the top you see, uh, you know, just a slight hint of a credit slash debit card. There's a chip on there. Inside that chip, there's a cryptographic key, which is used to authorize your payments in the conventional payments infrastructure. On the right, I show there a laptop with an update sign. Anytime that you download uh, updates, for your Mac or your Windows or Linux. Cryptography is used to ensure that those software updates actually come from who they claim to come from. You know, you only want to download software updates from Microsoft for your Windows computer. You only want to download updates for your Mac from Apple. Um, then moving on, you've got, you know, Hedera Hashgraph, you've got Bitcoin, Ethereum. Uh, these are, blockchain, DLT, cryptocurrencies, at the very core, they rely on cryptography for their operation. And finally, at the bottom, I've indicated the uh, HTTPS. When you're logging into your bank account online in the web browser and you see the little HTTPS sign top in the URL bar, well, that means that you're actually using cryptography to communicate with the website. And there's a lot of uh, fear going around, actually, how quantum computing will severely impact cryptography itself. You know, people are wondering whether it'll be completely, you know, useless, our cryptography, and what we need to do in that kind of situation. Uh, here I've put up a Wall Street Journal opinion, you know, talking about the quantum computing threat to American security. So what I'd like to do in this talk is kind of 
explain, you know, give you give you the information necessarily to to be able to understand these headlines better. You know, are we really is it is it really going to be an Armageddon once quantum computers are out, or is quantum computing actually going to be more like the Y two K bug, where people were predicting doom, but in the end there were a few glitches, but it didn't turn out to be as bad as we thought. So, just to briefly introduce myself, um, I'm a, look like Brady mentioned already. I'm the head of cryptography at Hedera. I come from an academic background. I did my PhD at the University of Louvain in Belgium, where I focus on design and analysis of cryptographic algorithms. Done a continued research um, as a postdoc, University of Louvain and UC Davis, and also as a research scientist at Visa Research, where I looked more at cryptography and how it was used in the conventional payments system and also for future payments systems uh, like blockchain and DLT. At Hedera, I'm focusing more on research on the online protocol itself and uh, helping with applications of cryptography throughout the company. So to explain the impact of quantum computing on cryptography, I'd like to walk you through a case study, a very, very simplified case study uh, where we're going to go through a Bitcoin transaction. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to go into all the details of how this Bitcoin transaction works. Uh, just three basic steps. Okay. So let's say you walk into a cafe which accepts Bitcoin as a payment and you'd like to pay for your coffee with Bitcoin. Uh, how this might work is you walk up to the merchant and you take your phone, you order a coffee, you take your phone and you unlock your phone. That's the first step. And then the merchant on its terminal displays maybe a QR code. You know, you scan that QR code with your phone and that prepares a transaction. That's the second step. Then the third step is that transaction gets sent to the blockchain and eventually gets included. Then after, you know, maybe about an hour or something, the merchant with very high, um, you know, probability can say that it's received your Bitcoin. So let's go into this first step. Let's see what cryptography is being used over there and what quantum, quantum computing will, how it will impact the cryptography. So unlocking the phone, let's actually talk about the opposite. What happens, what, what does your phone look like when it's locked? Well, you've got a bunch of information on there, sensitive information, pictures, documents. And when your phone is locked, and let's say you're using a fairly modern phone, then all that information is actually encrypted, okay? It's locked. Nobody can actually tell what information is contained on your phone. And not only that, they can't actually modify it. When you go through the process of unlocking your phone, either through a, you know, a thumbprint or facial scan, or let's say you type in your passcode, then a key is derived, which is used to unlock those files. Okay, once the files are unlocked, they can be read and used by the phone. So this process over here, this unlocking, locking of the files, this is, uses a method known as secret key cryptography. Okay, so secret key cryptography is a, it's a class of cryptographic algorithms which allow you to easily encrypt and decrypt using a single secret key. And the purpose of secret key cryptography is to make sure that the data remains hidden and unmodified. Okay, so you can kind of intuitively explain secret cryptography using an analogy of, uh, let's say, a lockbox. Right? You've, you've got some data that you want to hide, you put the data in the lockbox, and you lock it with a key. Okay, symmetric key crypto works exactly like that. And the biggest difference is that you're not using a physical key and you're not using a physical lockbox. Uh, you're using a digital key, so that's represented as a string of bits. Over here, I gave an example, you know, of a four bit key, it was a 1011. And the, the cryptographic algorithm is going to use that string of bits in order to hide your information. A prominent example of a symmetric key algorithm is the advanced encryption standard. And uh, we're probably using that algorithm right now uh, to communicate with each other. Um, so the a properly designed secret key uh, cryptographic algorithm the best known attack against it should be brute force key search, okay? So an attacker, the only thing that it should be able to do to be able to attack your, your lock, you know, your phone, 
is to exhaustively try out all possible keys. Okay, that's called a brute force key search. So for example, let's take this four bit key over here. If you wanted to try and attack it, then really what you try to do is, you know, you try the key consisting of all zero bits. Then you try the key consisting of three zero bits and a one bit. And if that doesn't succeed, you try two zero bits, one followed by a zero, et cetera, et cetera, until you finally hit the uh, correct key. So you can imagine this takes, well, okay, for a four bit key, this doesn't take too long. It takes about uh, two to four operations, which is 16 operations. Uh, but if you start increasing that key size, then it actually takes a really long time. So over here, I have, you know, if you have, let's say, a K bit key, on a classical computer, it would take about two to the K operations. So now you can wonder, okay, what happens in a quantum world? Let's say there are quantum computers around. Well, back in the 90s, um, there's this guy named Grover. He came up with an algorithm that actually illustrated that you can actually do this kind of brute force key search much faster. Instead of requiring two to the K operations, you only need two to the K over two operations to be able to recover that key. So instead of requiring 16 operations for this example I have right here, you'd only need four on a quantum computer. So that's, a, that's actually a pretty good speed up. Um, so let's apply this to a real world example. I already talked about AES. So AES comes with two key sizes. There's a 128 bit key size. If you were to use a classical computer to attack AES 128, it would take two to 128 operations. Now just to put that number in perspective, if you used the world's fastest supercomputer that exists nowadays uh, to perform this attack, it would take about a billion billion years, which is longer than the age of the universe. Okay, so it's just completely impossible to perform this kind of attack against AS-128. In contrast, let's say you had um, a huge quantum computer which could, you know, with no limits, then it would only require two to the 64 operations uh, on a quantum computer using Grover's algorithm. And the difference between 2 to 128 and 2 to 64, well, that 2 to 64 could even go down to a few days instead of requiring a billion, billion years. So that's, that's not great, you know, it's a significant speed up. But the advantage is, you know, this is not, um, this is not a complete breakdown of security. So AES actually has a bigger key size, a 256-bit key. On a classical computer, it would take two to 256 operations which is now an even more ridiculous number. This is more than the number of particles in the universe. And then if you look at the quantum computer, okay, you have that 256, you get two to the 128, great. Now we're back at that initial um, security level that we had with AS128. So great, no problem. So in fact, the impact of quantum computing on symmetric key crypto, is not gonna be that, uh, that problematic. You can just switch to the larger key size. And a lot of companies, uh, including Hedera, were already using AS-256. So no problem over there. Okay, so that's that first step, unlocking the phone and seeing how this metric key is, uh, crypto is using, being used over there and the impact on crypto. Um, I'd like to actually jump now to the third step in this, um, in this case study over here, sending a transaction to the blockchain, okay? And I'm not gonna go into too much detail because it's actually pretty similar to the first one of unlocking the phone. Namely, what happens is, let's say the transaction has been prepared. And now that transaction needs to be sent to the blockchain. Well, since we're dealing with the Bitcoin blockchain, that transaction gets sent to a miner. A miner bundles a whole bunch of transactions together into a block. And that block only gets added to the blockchain once the miner solves the so-called proof of work. Okay, uh, so proof of work, this is a type of puzzle that the miners have to solve. Um, it's constructed using hash functions. In the case of Bitcoin, it's SHA-256. Well, now this proof of work puzzle, all these miners are actually doing is a brute force search over, over a certain space, okay? So it's actually very analogous to the attack against um, this secret key crypto. 
instead of performing a brute force search over keys, you're doing a brute force search using inputs to the hash function. And that means that you can also, if you have a quantum computer, you can apply Grover's algorithm again and get a good speed up. But you can also adjust for that by increasing the difficulty of the proof of work or increasing the hash function output. So again, not a huge impact difference. Um, you might, we might end up in a world where the miners are forced to run all their mining operations on quantum computers. Um, but it's not, it's not a, it's not a concern for Bitcoin security or anything like that. Okay. So that's, that's step three. Now let's focus on step two, which is actually where the, the important stuff happens. Okay. So now we're preparing the transaction for the Bitcoin blockchain. Remember, we walked into the store, we're scanning that QR code on our phone. And when we scan that QR code, it contains uh, the transaction information, uh, namely that uh, you, you know, that you are going to be spending, okay, I wrote down one Bitcoin, that's a very expensive copy, let's say a few Satoshis. Um, and you're going to be sending that to your friend or to the merchant. Okay, that's what the transaction information is going to contain. And that transaction information is going to be sent through a so-called digital signature. Okay, so the purpose of this digital signature is to ensure that your transaction is authorized by you. Okay, so that anybody, once it enters the blockchain, everybody knows that, yeah, uh, you know, Atoll has authorized the purchase of this copy and is allowing this amount of Bitcoin to be sent from his address to the merchant's address. Okay, so a digital signature is a slightly different type of cryptographic algorithm than the secret key cryptography that I was talking about earlier. This is a, this is a type of public key cryptography, also known as asymmetric key. And the reason it's, it's known as asymmetric key is because now there's not just one key, there's actually two keys. So we're gonna keep uh, the secret key, I've displayed it here on the left with that blue key. Okay, but there's also going to be an accompanying public key, which is generated at the same time as the secret key. So now when you prepare your transaction, you use your secret key. You are the only person in the world who should have that secret key. You use your secret key to sign the transaction. Then anybody, once that transaction is put on the blockchain, anybody can verify that you signed that transaction using your public key. Um, so... Um, here I try to come up with kind of a, a real world analogy uh, to how digital signature might work. Um, it's not the best analogy, but I think it hits on some of the key points. So imagine, so on the secret key cryptography, I kind of said that it works exactly like a block box, right? You take your data, you put it in the lock box to lock it, and then nobody can modify it or see what's inside there. But digital signature, it's kind of like a see-through lock box, okay? So let's say that you have your see-through lockbox and you know, you're the weird guy with the see-through lockbox. So everybody knows that you've got the see-through lockbox, okay? Um, and you want to say, you want to, uh, you want to broadcast a message or send a message and you want to, you know, make sure that um, people know that it's from you, okay? So you, you're the only person in the world with the key to this lockbox. You write your message, you put it in the lockbox and you lock the box. Okay, and now you can send it to other people. And when they receive that lockbox, the see through lockbox, they can actually read the message and they know that it came from you because you're the one who locked it. Okay, now where this analogy kind of breaks down is that there's, there isn't really a public key in this analogy. Maybe the public key or the ID would be the lockbox itself. But it kind of gets the point across that, okay, so you're the only person in the world with that secret key. Uh, you can decide what message is in there. And as long as no one else has that secret key, they can't modify the message and everybody knows that you wrote that message. Okay. So that's how the digital signatures work and why it works to authorize transactions. So I've given two examples over here of digital signature algorithms. You know, there's RSA uh, 3084, that's what Hashcraft uses. There's ECDSA, that's what Bitcoin uses. And this is where we start seeing issues with quantum computing. If I, there's this algorithm known as Shor's algorithm, come up with the, I believe he came up with it in the 90s as well. And this actually completely destroys the security of both RSA and ECDSA. 
okay? In fact, the moment that you uh, broadcast your transaction onto the Bitcoin blockchain and your public key becomes properly public, then using Shor's algorithm, someone can actually recover that secret key and start uh, signing messages on your behalf, okay? So you can imagine that, okay, this is a problem. Now people can start authorizing transactions um, on my behalf um, using, and this is just through the normal operation of the blockchain. Okay, so this is obviously a big problem. And we don't have to look too far into the future to see what the real world impact of this would be. Although it's, you know, we can, I mean, it's a bit, it's not immediately obvious right now that people are paying with Bitcoin for coffee and etc. cetera. Um, but there is actually a real world example um, where we can talk about what happens when digital signatures are attacked like this. So back in 2012, there was this malware called Flame. Well, at least it was discovered in 2012. And what would it, it would do is if it was installed on your computer, um, it would start uh, recording all your Skype calls, um, logging all your keys. Basically, it was perfect surveillance tool for your uh, computer. Um, discovered in a whole bunch of Middle Eastern company, uh, countries and African countries. And the way that it was able to gain access to computers was it actually forged um, a certificate, the signatures from Microsoft, okay? So the designers of the malware, they actually broke the digital signature algorithm used by Microsoft to, pr to be able to say that their malware actually comes from Microsoft, okay? So this is getting back to, in the beginning of the presentation, talked about how software updates, they use cryptography to ensure that the software updates um, are actually, um, you know, actually valid. And so, uh, and so people are actually able to exploit this, okay? So the fact that they were able to exploit this algorithm uh, and broke it meant that um, it was a very powerful attack. It, was, it went undetected for five years and it's very widely applicable. Okay. Um, so I, I'm, I'm seeing a question, did the CIA make this? I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to remember. I think there is some speculation that it was definitely a state level attacker, um, but I cannot remember if it, was, if it was a CIA or someone else. I'm not sure if they figured out who it, who it was. <laughs> Okay, uh, so this is kind of illustrates a little bit of what happens when a cryptographic algorithm is, is attacked and the power of attacking these cryptographic algorithms. Okay, and, and, and by the way, this, this, uh, this cryptographic attack, so amongst the academic community, the cryptographic algorithm was known to be broken already since the 90s. Okay, and many, I mean, to their credit, many companies were aware of this fact, and they were shifting away from the use of this cryptographic algorithm to better ones. So um, it just comes to show that, you know, cryptography, it's used all over the place. And although, you know, you might be aware of a vulnerability, it's difficult sometimes to actually find every single spot where it's used and swap it out for a more secure variant. Okay. So that's that. So let's just quickly take a step back and summarize what are these three uh, points that I just made, right? So we saw secret key cryptography, we saw hash functions, we saw digital signatures, kind of more broadly public key cryptography. So the conclusion with the first two is that the impact is, it's pretty straightforward. You know, all you need to do is increase the key length, increase the output size, and then you're fine. And this can be done pretty easily and without a serious impact to efficiency. Digital signature algorithms, public key cryptography, you need entirely different algorithms, okay? The, the ones that are currently widely deployed are vulnerable to, uh, vulnerable to attack, okay? So next steps. How much time do we have? You know, okay, this is pretty serious. Well, and what can we do about it? So first, first question, how much time do we have? This is actually a really difficult question to answer. Um, I'm also not a quantum physicist, so I'm relying on other people's estimates. Uh, but based on what I've seen is basically, you've got, you've, you've got a current quantum computer, the one that we have nowadays by Google, IBM. 
they're fewer than um, they operate on fewer than a hundred qubits. Okay, um, a qubit. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but that's let's say is a quantum equivalent of a bit. Okay. So these qubits that are currently deployed, they're very noisy. So that means that they're not very reliable and you need to build in a lot of redundancy to operate reliably, okay? It's official term is error correction, okay? The best attacks, so Shor's attack, you would need on the order of thousands of logical qubits. These are perfect qubits that don't have any errors. With error correction, if you add in the redundancy, then all of a sudden you need hundreds on the order of hundreds of thousands of qubits. Okay, so just to compare that, we're currently at less than 100 qubits, and to be able to mount Shor's attack, you'd need on the order of hundreds of thousands. So I've seen estimates range from in 10 years, we'll probably have a 200 qubit computer that we can use reliably. This is again from Scott Aronson to a very optimistic estimate that we'll have a, a quantum computer with a half a million qubits in 10 years, okay? If that's the case, then yes, there, there will be a quantum computer out there that can actually very efficiently break public key crypto, okay? But that again, that's a very optimistic estimate. Um, it seems like in general, people seem to think it's at least 10 years away before we have to really be worried, okay? So what solutions are out there? What can we do? So there is a significant amount of research going on in post-quantum crypto, okay? Already for the past few decades, um, there's quite a few different types of algorithms out there that can be used uh, to replace our existing algorithms. So um, I've listed a few of them, um, general classes, you know, lattices, hash functions, code-based, uh, multivariate, um, public key crypto systems, okay? And a lot of these are very promising um, as replacements for our current cryptographic algorithms. The only reason we're not really using them yet is because the general academic community hasn't quite agreed on the right way forward, okay? There's still questions about efficiency, questions about, okay, which ones would be the easiest to securely implement. Um, although there's a lot of work ongoing, okay? Um, I mean, to kind of give you an idea, there's this, I've, I've, I've put this image up there of an ostrich in Turkey, and it's to kind of indicate the trade-offs that people are trying to make when switching to the post-quantum algorithms, right? So you've got, you've got some post-quantum algorithms which act more like ostriches, you know? They're super fast, but they're really big, okay? So that means that maybe the, uh, it wouldn't take much time to compute, but their signatures or the key sizes are really large, so it take a long time to communicate. And there are other uh, post-quantum crypto algorithms which are small but slow, like a turkey. Okay, so, um, so that means that their key sizes and their <clears throat> output sizes are pretty small, but it takes a really long time for them to compute. Okay, if you'd like to see more about this, then uh, there's the National, <clears throat> sorry. There's the National Institute on Standards and Technologies. There, well, I called it a competition. Really, it's a post-quantum project that they're running to determine the best post-quantum algorithms. Okay, so they're currently in the second phase. They have about 20 candidates right now and they're trying to figure out which way is the best way to move forward. So to conclude, basically, we need to wait and see, okay? So quantum computers are still a little ways away, okay? We don't expect them to, uh, anybody to have a sizable quantum computer which we will, would be able to completely break our known public key crypto algorithms, okay? We already know that our hash functions are fine. We already know that our symmetric key algorithms are fine. And we already know that there are there are promising alternatives in the works, okay? So it's just a question of waiting standardization, seeing what the academic community uh, kind of focuses on and then adopting whatever everyone else adopts, okay? Um, but again, just as indicated with the flame malware, you know, you need to keep paying attention. You can't just ignore the cryptography. You can't just idly wait and see. You need to remain crypto agile. Right. You need to have the ability to switch algorithms quickly if necessary. 
right? This entire presentation I did based on our best knowledge, but of course, all of a sudden, some researcher could come up with the most amazing attack ever, breaking all known crypto, okay? So you always need to be very vigilant when it comes to cryptography. Okay, so that concludes my talk. Um, thank you very much for your attention. If you'd like some more further resources, I have a few articles over here. I think we'll be making these slides public so you can uh, have a look at this in your own time. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Atul. And um, as a reminder for everyone, we are going to be sending out a uh, link to the recording as well as the slides after the conclusion of the webinar. At this point, we're going to jump into a quick Q&A. So if you have any questions about the content that a tool had just presented, there's a Q&A box on the bottom of your screen. So feel free to enter your questions there. We've got a couple questions that we'll start with here. Uh, the first one is from Connor. And Connor's asking how long it's going to take for the public to be able to afford uh, a quantum computer at home, home like an affordable uh, for the public, it's 5, 10, 20 years. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> well, OK. So an affordable quantum computer, I would imagine it taking quite a few more decades. Okay. Um, already, oh, I don't have a I don't have a good estimate for that. But let's say you know, imagine you know, thirty, forty, fifty years from now, you might be able to afford like a small quantum computer. Um, again, I say it's not going to really affect impact your day to day tasks. Um, you know, maybe you want to run some homebrew experiments yourself or something like that on a quantum computer. But um, I'd, I'd say that's really far down the line. Awesome. And then another question, um, are you using quantum computers for the encryption? So I actually know the answer to that. I know we're not using quantum computers to, to um, create the encryption, but I'm going to turn that question into something different. Could you use a quantum computer to uh, create better encryption? Mm -hmm. Okay. So there is, I've been talking about post quantum cryptography right now. Okay. This is, cryptography running on classical computers, which need to be secured against quantum computers, okay? Um, there's also this thing called quantum cryptography, which is using the principles of quantum mechanics, okay, to get cryptographic guarantees. So there's, uh, there's these, you know, there's these basic principles like entanglement, interference, etc where you know where quantum cryptography what they try to do is they set up a quantum information channel between two parties so that if anybody ever tries to eavesdrop on that channel using the properties of quantum physics you can actually detect that someone is eavesdropping okay um so that quantum cryptography is um let's say it's very specialized. It's incredibly expensive. It's not uh, quite scalable, okay? But it's very cool. Um, then there's, I guess, uh, more directly answering question. You could, you could wonder, okay, let's try, what happens if we start implementing our classical uh, cryptographic algorithms, start implementing them on quantum computers? Well, I would from the get-go, I wouldn't recommend to actually, once you start to your crypto, classical cryptographic algorithms on quantum computers, they're actually even more devastating attacks, uh, which I did not go into here. Um, and this is, this is, you know, research that's come up in the past few years. If you, let's say you're, uh, you know, we're 50 years down the line, you've got a laptop, which is for some reason a quantum computer, and you're running cryptography on there, where there's actually some um, pretty devastating attacks, even against the symmetric crypto crypto that you're running on the laptop. So basically, I wouldn't recommend doing it. Okay, and um, what are some of the things that uh, quantum computing is not good at? So quantum computing anti patterns, um, or let's say what quantum computing is no better at than classical computers. Right. Is it, would that be, I mean, because I'm not sure, I'm not sure how much people have looked into the types of problems that quantum computers are even worse at than regular computers. Um, but we know that they're definitely no better than problems like the traveling salesman problem or, you know, if I just go back to the, 
you know, at let's say playing chess or something like that. Um, scheduling airline flights, there's another one, proving theorems, okay? If you'd like to see more about that, you should definitely have a look at this uh, article by Scott Aronson. Okay. Excellent. And um, do we have an idea of any reasonable quantum computing applications that someone could implement today on, say, Amazon or Google's quantum services? Hmm. Interesting. Um, I mean, so my guess is, I mean, interesting applications let's say I'd, I'd say there's just like little toy examples that you could do right now because they're pretty small quantum computers um and again i'm not the best person to actually ask about the applications of quantum computing just mostly because i've been concerned about you know how it's going to impact cryptography and like the negative sides of it uh, i can imagine that you might be able to you know run some small scale tests or experiments on drug discovery or you know, uh, fertilizers design, running chemical reactions, like small scale versions of it. Although I'm not sure if they're providing enough qubits to be able to do it. Actually, uh, I mean, an interesting toy application might be to, you know, implement Shor's algorithm, uh, try to factor some numbers or something like that. Um, yeah, don't know. So we have a question from uh, Gioiti. Um, quantum has been touted as the existential threat to DLT blockchain cryptography. What would be your response to that? Um, okay, well, first of all, the, it's an existential threat to um, the entire internet, as we know it, okay? So it's not limited to blockchain DLT. Uh, cryptography it's it's literally everything that we're doing okay so uh, the the internet it operates uh, requires the use of these certificates digital signatures to verify that you are actually talking with whom you're talking to um, and quantum computing poses a threat to those okay um, and this is an ex existential threat I wouldn't call it an existential threat because we have we know we have alternatives. We can actually switch them today. Uh, the only problem is we take a performance hit. So we're trying to find the best possible alternative, but it's, it's really not an issue. And a question from Yusuf, uh, what does Hedera mean when saying that the platform is quantum resistant? Well, okay, first it's, it's not quantum resistant because we rely on digital signature algorithms, okay, uh, on, RSA 3084, which is not quantum resistant, okay? It's not post-quantum post secure. Um, there are other aspects of um, Hashgraph which will remain um, post-quantum secure, okay? Like the use of AES, the use of our hash functions, those aspects will remain secure, but it's, it's, as it is, it's not quantum secure, okay? We are, however, crypto agile, so we can easily switch to a uh, post-quantum secure algorithm when, you know, everybody's agreed upon one, uh, but we are not currently. Would a quantum computer perform better at attacks that are not brute force based? From Mike. Um, so, uh, yeah, so the, the two main, so the two main ones are, so there's Grover's, which is brute force based. Okay. And then there's, uh, and Shores, which is not brute force based. Okay. So over here in this slide, I talked about, you know, the speed up offered by Grover's algorithm and its impact on symmetric crypto and hash functions. And then there's the digital signature algorithm and public key crypto in general. And here specifically, you've got the RSA and an ECDSA uh, algorithms. Um, so a Shor's algorithm, it's, it's, not, it's not of the form of a speed up like brute force. It's a completely different one, okay? It actually is able to factor integers much faster 
or compute discrete logarithms much faster. So it actually uses a lot more details of the underlying algorithms than a brute force search. And a question from uh, Eamon, could you use a quantum computer to unlock uh, lost Bitcoin keys or even you know, account keys for any other type of uh, ledger? <laughs> yeah, actually you could. I mean, so you've got the, as long as you've got the public key and you've got a big enough quantum computer, you can actually recover those secret keys and, uh, and start spending them, yeah. <laughs> and would, would quantum computing impact the history of consensus on Hashgraph? No. Um, so, the, um, so the history is always represented as a hash function output. Okay. Um, so we've got a, we're using SHA-384. Uh, quantum computer is not going to be able to break SHA-384. So as long as you have a... Um, a given hash function output, you know that the history has not changed from there, um, from that point. And then where does uh, zero knowledge uh, cryptography fit into, into this story? Where does it fit into this story? So I guess how would, uh, what this person probably means is how would, how would quantum computing maybe affect someone's ability to do uh, zero knowledge? Uh, zero knowledge proofs, yeah. Um, okay, I haven't thought of, I haven't thought about it too much. Uh, my gut reaction is that zero knowledge techniques used for zero knowledge proofs, a good amount of them might be vulnerable to quantum computers, so might have to come up with uh, post quantum uh, post post quantum um, versions of zero knowledge proofs. But I'd have to double check that. I'm not hundred percent sure about that. And we've got a question from JJ, and JJ says, uh, "What kinds of things have you been working on at at Hedera um, since you since you've joined?" <laughs> cool. Um, yeah. So the main thing I've been focusing on is the Hashgraph protocol itself. Um, so we've we've been uh, so you might have heard of this whole fairness thing, you know, um, with Hashgraph and how that's kind of a differentiating factor of uh, the Hashgraph protocol over others. Um, so like one of the first things that I did while when joining was actually working together with Lehman to come up with a very concrete definition of what it means for the Hashgraph protocol to be fair and proving that it actually achieves this uh, definition of fairness and trying to understand better, okay, you know, could you actually get fairness from other DLTs um, and so we actually were working on a paper and the, and the goal is to get that published at the academic conference. So this is one of the main things. Uh, I've also been conducting more fundamental research on the future of the protocol. You know, how can we make it more efficient? Um, are there, you know, fast ways of making a post quantum secure? Are there, you know, just general research questions around the protocol? Awesome, and I think we've got time for just uh, one more question here. Um, let's see. So uh, this person's question is, does, does quantum computers, do quantum computers, uh, are they a threat to enterprise solutions as well? Someone building maybe an enterprise application. Uh, yeah. They're validating various enterprise level use cases for Hedera. Yeah, short answer is yes. Um, just because a lot of enterprise use cases use, um, rely heavily on PKIs, public key infrastructures, certificates. Um, so if you have any kind of enterprise solution which relies on public key crypto, it'll be vulnerable. You can, if you are careful, you can come up with uh, enterprise solutions which might just, I mean, it, it totally depends on your use case and your application. You could come up with a version which only uses symmetric key crypto and hash functions, and then you'd automatically be post quantum secure. Uh, but short answer is yes, uh, your enterprise applications are going to be vulnerable as well. So it's, it's basically, you know, there's a lot out there that's vulnerable, right? So it's again, not unique to DLT or blockchain. It's everything out there. Awesome. Well, thank you so much again, uh, Atul, for presenting. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Um, if you have questions that weren't answered, um, 
uh, you can reach out over uh, over Twitter, and we can try and answer some of those questions that that uh, if that you're curious about. We'll be sending the slides and a recording out through email, and uh, I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you guys.